Are you looking for inspiration on a daily basis? Well, check out Deal to Heal Teas. With our inspirational teas, you are sure to find something that will inspire you. Just go to Deal to Heal Teas dot myshopify.com that's deal to heal teas put some inspiration in your situation wear inspirational tea and be inspired all day that's deal to heal teas at deal to heal teas dot myshopify.com Hey guys, this is Ernest James, host of the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast. And I got a question to ask you. Could you buy me a cheeseburger? Better yet, could you buy me a value meal? Yes? Well, guess what? I don't need a value meal. However, for the cost of a value meal, you can support this podcast to keep us on the air. Just go to Patreon slash Deal to Heal podcast and choose any one of the three tiers that's available. And if you just want to make a one-time donation, go to Cash App. And make a donation to dollar sign E James, the number 418. Make a one time donation to the Cash App, or again, go to Patreon to support this podcast and keep us on the air. Thanks in advance. Be blessed. Welcome to Heal to Heal with E. James Podcast. On this podcast, my guest and I will discuss topics and ways to help us to heal in every area of our lives. I believe that everyone can live a life that is happy, healthy, and whole. So I'm on a mission to help people to deal, heal, and fulfill. Deal with your problem, heal from the pain, and fulfill your purpose. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get to it. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast. I am your host, Ernest James, and I believe that everyone can and should live a life that is whole, healed, and healthy. And therefore, I'm on a mission to help people to deal, to heal, and to fulfill, to deal with your problems, to heal with the, from the pain, and to fulfill your purpose. Thank you guys once again for tuning in to the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast. Um, if you haven't already, please listen, like, subscribe, and share. Uh, make sure you guys are following us on our uh, YouTube channel because we want to get those numbers up. Um, and therefore, you can find all the videos and some extra videos also from uh, things that I may have done on as a guest on other platforms that I also have that's, uh, that's there. So you are, they have a lot of information there. Uh, far as videos and things to watch on our YouTube channel. Also, make sure you are following us on our uh, Facebook page uh, because on our Facebook page, we're able to give you more information on a day-to-day -day basis with things that we have going on. And also, when you like, uh, when you join our Facebook page, you will be also asked to join the Deal, Heal, Fulfill community. Uh, we definitely have a lot of things that we're uh, going to have going on there, things that we want to add. Um, that we want to make sure you guys are able to uh, enjoy, take part in, you know, and just grow and learn from. So make sure that you guys are following us there. And also on our uh, Spotify or podcast, the audio podcast on Spotify or wherever you listen to uh, your audio podcast, make sure you guys are checking us out. And also make sure you stay to the end. I'm going to tell you how you can win $100 from the podcast uh, and our uh, contest, and it don't cost you anything, but you have to stay to the end to get that information. All right. So today, just like any other day, we are blessed with a guest, Miss Laverne. How are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I am good. I am good. First of all, let me say thank you for being here. Thank you for being on because you could have been doing anything else, but you're here with me and my listeners, and I want you to know up front that I definitely appreciate it. I appreciate so, you. No problem, no problem. So we're going to jump right in. So, Mr. Byrne, first thing I want you to do is to introduce yourself uh, to my listeners and tell us exactly who you are and what it is that you do. Absolutely. So my name is Laverne Gordon, and I am the founder of an organization called 
Love Life Now Foundation. Uh, we promote year-round awareness around the issue of domestic violence. Uh, we try to keep the issue in the forefront as much as possible because many times when people get to the end of these types of relationships, they don't know where to go um, or where to seek help. Uh, so that's one of the primary things we do around the, on the awareness front. We do many other things, but I'll leave that to the chat. Uh, and then I'm also a published author of a book called The Legacy He Left Me, which is a domestic violence awareness memoir uh, that talks about my experience as a domestic violence uh, survivor two times over, uh, once as a young adult uh, and once as a child witness. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm all things domestic violence awareness because this issue is so near and dear to me. Okay, okay. So... I'm glad you mentioned that both of those uh, are things that I wanted to uh, address. Um, but let's go back. Let's go back to the beginning because you you started, one of the things that you mentioned is being a witness of uh, domestic violence as a child. So yeah. um, I don't know how, how young we were, you were at that time, but let's just go back to maybe before the first time that you witnessed it and how you were as a child. And then, you know, what age was that that you witnessed it? And just how do you think it affected you at that time, at the age that you were then? Yeah, all good questions. And so uh, one of my earliest memories, unfortunately, is watching our father brutally abuse our mother. Um, I lived in Trinidad up until I was 15. And so, again, one of my earliest memories, uh, Trinidad in the Caribbean, uh, one of my earliest memories is watching him brutally beat her inside of our house. And it's something that I will never forget. I remember feeling, you know, belly twisted up in knots, um, your stomach tied up, uh, fear, um, sadness, anger at him, uh, you know, helplessness. Uh, because as a child, you know, six or seven years old, again, is one of my earliest memories of me knowing who I was as a, as a child. Um, you can't do anything you are stuck in the situation that you were dealt. And you're looking to parents to love and nurture and care for you, all the things that you see on TV. You want that same thing for yourself as a child. And when it's not happening, you feel helpless uh, because you can't turn to your parents, especially the parent that is doing the abusing. Um, and so, you know, my father ruled with a strict fist, uh, no pun intended there, but you know, he, the way that he grew up was knowing that abuse was the way to show love or to command respect or to gain love and respect. And so he perpetuated this behavior in his own relationship. I mean, he was with my mother since the age of 19 um, until he passed away. And so, you know, both of them, this was their first serious relationship then into marriage and uh five children later which is you know how many you know children they had all together um this was a prominent fixture in our household and you know again how it made me feel was helpless um you know i had wished many times that our mother would run away sometimes she would and uh, you know escaping a physical attack sometimes of in the middle of a verbal attack and thinking to myself, why doesn't she stay gone? Or if she was able to grab one or two of us at the time to run away with, I was wondering all at all times, why don't we stay gone? Uh, because anything was better than what we were experiencing. Um, unfortunately, my, in my mother's mind at the time, she was barely elementary school ed educated. Um, so barely had an education depended heavily on our father, who was the financial breadwinner, um, you know, doubted herself because of all the emotional and mental abuse mm -hmm. that she experienced over the years. And in her mind, she did not see a good future for us as children if she had taken us and, and ran away and stayed gone. And so our father, in a stark contrast, he was college educated he was well-spoken, articulate, had a really good job with the Department mm. of Labor, you know, in Trinidad. And so he had all the things going for him. So, you know, this is the 80s that I really knew myself. I was born in 77, but I'm an 80s child by, through and through. And so, um, you know, when, you know, this is happening, you know, the, the, the term domestic violence isn't really even coined yet in the Caribbean at that time. 
we knew abuse very well in the area that I lived in because many other households perpetuated it and theirs too. Um, but even if the police were called, just by luck and chance, if some neighbor called the police because it was so brutal and so noisy and so angry um, and the police showed up, they would, they would, you know, put it aside as a husband and wife thing, you know, Mr. So-and-so, don't do that again. Or, you know, we'll come lock you up or, you know, you guys got to sort that out because if we show up again, it was not taken with a level of seriousness. And as a child, again, you're watching the people that you see on TV that are supposed to come save you, the, mm -hmm. the people that are supposed to come help you. And yet I'm seeing this and it's like, okay, if they can't save her, Nobody can, right? Um, I even looked to, to, to other men in our neighborhood who were friends with our father, who respected our father, because outside of the house, he was very charismatic. He was very well-spoken. He was very charming. And then in the house, you know, at various times, he was a monster. So I looked to the men that he hung around with that, you know, respected him and to, to think to myself, well, okay, at some point, they're either going to beat him up too. Cause again, as a child, you're like, you know, mm -hmm. fight violence with violence. Right. Um, you know, they're either going to beat him up too for him to learn a lesson, or they're going to pull him square and say, you shouldn't be doing that to your wife, but nobody did. Um, you know, and I, it was only until I got older that I understood why, why would they come and tell a friend of theirs to stop what he's doing when they're doing it in their households too. Right. It's like calling right. the, the kettle black. And right. so, you know, that kind of sums up what my childhood looked like until I, you know, migrated to the States when I was 15. OK, so one of the questions that I that I ask when I'm talking to different people, even on different occasions, but I always ask about, you know, uh, the the generations that something happens. Right. And to see, you know, when you look at your story or how something affects you, then I always say, look back and see how far back that it goes, you know? And so, you know, I know you mentioned that it, it was not a um, uh, new thing, you know, that this was happening at that time, but do you think that it, this also was reflective of how your parents grew up? Because now you're seeing it in your household. Do you also think that it was something that they seen growing up or maybe even their parents seen growing up to the point where it would just pass down as, as normal, you know, in, in the households. Yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, I, I quickly mentioned that my father grew up seeing that as well. My, my mother's parents did not perpetuate, uh, abuse in their household. So she didn't see it there. Um, my father's father, uh, beat, we know I know of one particular instance where she was put in the hospital by him after a, a beating, uh, which is my paternal grandmother. Um, so again, this is exactly what he knew, uh, and this is what he perpetuated. And again, when they met at 19, you barely have a sense of what relationships supposed to be. And if the mm -hmm. only grounding you have is to beat on your wife to make sure that she's quote unquote, stays in line, or this is how you raise children. Because not only did he beat on her, but I have two older siblings who were the oldest, seven seven years apart from me for the oldest. And then that the next one is two years apart from the oldest, right? So about seven to five, six years apart. Um, you know, they received the brunt of the child abuse, right? So, you know, not as brutal as attacks that my mother received, but certainly on the level of overkill uh, when it came to disciplining children. And so by the time I came into the picture seven years later, um, again, I'm six years old at the time when I realized that this is happening and this is a bad thing that I don't want to ever happen to me. I just wanted to do everything I could to not get that level of attention from him. Um, so, you know, again, he was very strict. So he wanted the girls to go to school and get good grades. He wanted the boys to stay out of trouble. He wanted the girls not to come home pregnant. He wanted the girls to speak well. 
Um, and so again, me being the only other girl, I said, okay, I'm going to do all of those things. I'm going to get good grades. I got really good grades. Um, I did the chores above and beyond. I was very courteous to many people in the neighborhood, so much so that even though my name was Laverne, people, you know, adopted this nickname of Lovey because I was always smiling and, you know, helping and can I help and whatever. And so um, he, he, he admired that. I could see that he liked that. He never shared that verbally, but I, again, I knew that these are things that he um, wanted. And, and because of that, I didn't get that level of discipline in his eyes. Um, what he saw was discipline. Um, as I, as I rose up um, to, you know, as a, till 14, 15 years old, I, I was able to, he, I, I because of all of that, I he let me migrate to the States um, to live with my maternal grandparents who had lived here since the 70s. Um, they had seen something in me in terms of, uh, you know, potential and he as well. So he wanted me to get better opportunities here in the States. And again, that's how I migrated to the States, leaving my siblings and my parents behind. Okay, and so, and so you come to the States and and this is a, another kind of connected to the the last question because now you come to the states now you're in a different environment under a different roof you know with different parents um mm -hmm. but it, you still find yourself in a similar situation yeah you know? so tell me a little bit about that even that relationship how it, it started because i'm sure it didn't start like that you know right. from the get-go but then at some point you know it's it starts to you know show itself that okay, yes. here, here come this this thing that i was running from but now i'm facing it again right yeah absolutely and you're completely right so again totally different environment thousands of miles away um not experiencing abuse but that foundation that was laid mentally and emotionally was there whether mm -hmm. i liked it or not and for all intent purposes, I kept telling myself up until the age of, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, that that would never be me, right? I would never let anybody treat me the way my father treated our mother. I, I had watched, like I said, I, I was big on, you know, in the Caribbean, a lot of the, the, the American programming came through. And so I'm watching Saved by the Bell and the Cosby show and all of these shows that really, you know, showed you what family and, and, and friends were supposed to be. And so, um, you know, again, by the time I entered college, I had a, a entry level job in corporate America, uh, working um, at this financial company. Uh, and outside of that, I, you know, was going to a university study studying advertising and marketing at the time. And even though I still lived with my grandparents, I was on my way to, to you know, at some point getting my own apartment. So I'm 21 at this point, and I'm thinking I have it all together and things are going great. And uh, just before I entered that that um, financial services company, I worked for another company for about maybe three or four months. And at that point, I met this gentleman who uh, had tried to get my number for a couple weeks straight. Um, you know, and he did everything in his power to get my attention, and he get, he did. So I gave him my number and we started dating, uh, more so with a lot of talks over the phone um, that then led into seeing each other in person a lot more. Uh, and I think within the matter of like three weeks, we had become smitten with each other because he was very charming. He was very charismatic. And when I look back, he was a lot of the things my father was. He was, you know, the, this person that I admired for the way he spoke and the way he dressed and, 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 and all the things. And he was courteous and opening doors and lavish dates that, you know, was straight out of a Hallmark movie in, in terms of how he courted me. And three months into the relationship, I was now working at this financial services company. And I remember feeling very sick that morning. I had started suffering from allergies and I didn't know what it was. I had never suffered from it before. And so I thought it was a really bad cold and decided to call the office to say that I wasn't coming in. Um, every morning, however, this gentleman and I would speak, you know, on my way to the office at least three, four, five times. And I, I was thinking, 
wow, this is so great that we have this connection that we can talk like this all the time. Um, not realizing that it was a big red flag, that he was calling me, making sure that I was where I was at any given point. Mm -hmm. um, and so this particular morning, I was not able to speak with him. I actually just kind of dismissed that we were we, we would talk that morning, assuming at some point that we would talk later during the day. And I put my cell phone away and went to bed because I was so groggy. And he um, kept calling until I finally heard the phone, picked it up. And I said, oh, my God, I said, I'm so sick. I said, are you going to come bring me some chicken soup? And he said, chicken soup. He said, why the hell are you home? And I said, well, you know, again, I feel sick. I said, stop playing around. I said, you're going to come bring me some soup. And he said, no, I'm not bringing you any soup. And he hung up the phone loudly in my ear. Within 15 minutes, he was at my house. Um, when I answered the door again, this is at a time where I lived with my grandparents in a three-story home and everybody had gone to work in school. And so he comes in the door, he barges past me and goes into the bedroom that I occupy and started rummaging through my stuff very suspiciously. And then he started accusing me of staying home that morning to be with someone else. And I said, Oh my God, are you crazy? I said, I am sick. I said, I'm, I'm actually really glad to see you. And he, he wasn't taking that for an explanation. He got even more suspicious. His voice got even more irate. His body language was, you know, moving in a threatening manner. I remember sitting at the edge of the bed when he came over me after he, you know, again, spewed accusations that I had been stayed, I stayed home to be with someone. And he said to me, I knew you were too good to be true. And then slapped me so hard that I saw stars. And then he stormed outside and left me there. So I'm sitting there and I'm holding my face, trying to figure out what just happened. Like it just, it was like this big blur that blew through this in the matter of minutes. And then it, it ended in this big thing. And then I said, I'm crying. I'm, I'm, I'm upset. I'm, I'm, I'm sad. I'm confused. And then I caught myself after a few minutes and I said, you know what? No, I told the truth. Why? I didn't cause this. And so I'm, I'm through. Um, well, that lasted about a weekend. I, you know, left and went on a, a, a trip to New York. I, I'm, I'm a, I lived outside of Boston. I lived just outside of Boston at the time. And I went to New York to treat myself. It was close to my birthday. And then when I came back, my younger brother, who was now in the States as well at that time, um, met me at the door and he said, you're pretty popular around here. And he said, so-and-so, uh, my ex, left something for you. Uh, and I said, I went into my bedroom and it was two dozen purple roses, my favorite color at the time and still is one of them. And I went in there and I looked at this, this huge bouquet and there was this card that said, I miss you, I love you, I'm sorry, call me. And that melted my heart because in my mind I'm saying, okay, he's taken elaborate steps to apologize for this very bad thing that he did. And so I called him. Uh, when I turned on my phone, there were a slew of messages that him sounding very, you know, despondent and worried and sick and sad about what had happened. And so I called him back and I heard him out. And in that exchange, he said to me, and I remember this succinctly, he said in part, um, you know, I love you so much that like it, it basically pained him to even think of me with some, think of me with someone else. And that I had in essence sort of drove him to act that mm -hmm. way. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the accountability that I didn't understand that he wasn't taken at the time fell on me. He put the onus on me to do better. Right. right. So don't ever make, let me think that way anymore. Like you have to call me, you have to check in. Right. And so now it's on my brain that I got to do better. Right. Uh, not even subconsciously in my mind during that apology, the first one, I'm saying to myself, you know what, Laverne, I do have to do better. I should have called him. I should have checked in. Um, you know what, Laverne, even though he hit me, it was just a slap. It wasn't as bad as what my mother had gone through. So this is nothing like what she had experienced. So it's okay. Um, you know what, Laverne? Uh, even though he slapped me and he did a bad thing, he apologized. My father 
never did that. I mean, and if he did, it was in the onus of buying her a skirt or taking her to a movie, like something to appease her in the moment. I didn't understand that that is what was happening to me. Right, this right. thing was unfolding before my eyes and there was, I, I had blinders on. I refused to see the red flags. I refused to understand the number of calls that he called me every single morning was a red flag in checking up on me. I refused to see that keeping me on the phone for hours at a time made sure that I wasn't going to be talking to anyone else. I refused to see that each time I received a call or you know, saw someone in passing that was of the opposite sex, it made him uncomfortable. I, questions as to why is the, he calling you? Uh, you know, well, he's been my friend since I was 15. <laughs> I mean, we've been friends for a long time, right? There's nothing there, but he made it bad. It's like when you're teaching a child, right? That's coming up, that's, you know, learning to talk or do things or knows the difference between right and wrong. You know, you make them know that, you know, uh, let's say a grown up touching them in certain areas is a bad thing. Like they know because you, so he, here he was grooming me uh, to the point where, again, I was made to believe that friends that had been friends for a long time were bad people. Even women who were my friends for a long time that may have been single. Well, you know, that's not kind of the kind of friend you want to have because she can take you out and make you want to get another man. And I don't trust her. I mean, these were things that were being poured into me um, from the very beginning. And then by three months, once that first attack happened and I accepted that first apology, that's how easy it was to get delved into subconsciously um, a, a, an abusive relationship that spawned two, two years. I hear people often ask, how do women or anybody, how does anybody fall into this type of relationship? That would never be me. Um, I'm too smart. I would never stand for that. Well, it's as easy as that, right? Um, accepting that first apology because you've made, you know, exceptions for the behavior. You didn't address the behavior. You didn't cut off the boundary. You didn't set the boundary. Big thing in relationships in the beginning when you're starting out, no matter how old you are. Um, boundaries are a big thing. And once people cross them, they just seek to see how furthermore they can cross other boundaries you have. Because if she let me do it one time, gosh, <laughs> sky's the limit. Um, yeah. And that's where we were, right? Is here we are. I have this woman who, you know, is willing to let me slap her, apologize with flowers. Um, and, and I, let's see what else, uh, she will allow me to do. So that happened, that went on, as I mentioned for about two years until I got to the breaking point, my breaking point, which is where a lot of victims have to get to when they're in these types of relationships is their breaking point that they just can't do it anymore. I had gotten there two years later. Um, yeah. And, yeah. So, so I, I asked you that, I asked you that for, for two reasons. Um, the first reason I, I asked you that, because one of the things that I, I do, um, I, I work with um, fatherless daughters, you know, and so there are some questions that I, you know, ask them. And also I have a male mentoring program. So I work with fatherless sons also. And so one of the things I try to get people to understand is what you're exposed to at a younger age makes an impression on you, whether you realize it or not. Absolutely. So I'm, I've often asked the question of why, you know, uh, a guy who grew up without his father would then have kids and not be in their life. Right. right. And it's like, because of course, when they, when they're younger and they're growing up, they're saying, I'm not, I'll never do my kids like that. You know, right. but then they turn into adults and they do the same exact thing. Absolutely. And the way I, I, I explain it is our minds is like a computer. Yes, but like a computer, it can only operate on the information that 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 you it put in. Yeah, you know, and so as a child, only thing you know if you grew up without a father or if you grew up in certain environments is what that environment teaches you. So Absolutely. even though you may say, "Oh, I'm not going to recreate this same environment," your brain can only operate on the what information you it has. What yeah, you know. so if you don't know any better, even though right. you feel like, you know, 
I'm, I'm not going to do it. But again, on autopilot, your mind is just going off the information that it has. And so since this is your norm, this is what you've been exposed to. This is the information that you have, even unknowingly, you know, or even against your own better judgment that, no, I would never do that. Automatically, you're just going to do it unless you put some more information for yourself to, to grow on. So you have to or, or you make a conscious effort and have make a conscious choice, right? Because when we are children there's not a lot of choice making mm -hmm. happening right. but then you're exposed to different i i had an exposure as i mentioned to a whole different environment um but i easily reverted back to what i knew for 15 years right versus what i saw and took in for three, four years after that, now in a different environment. Those years had already had an embedding. I then needed to make a conscious choice that this wasn't going to be it, but it was so much better. So I say that to say that, so parents, I often say this in conjunction with what you just talked about. Parents are the first indicators about what our adult relationships are going to look like. Mm -hmm. So if you if you all you've seen is a loving environment or 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 you've received love from a loving environment, that's what you're gonna put out in the world. If all you know is violence, that's what you're gonna reciprocate in the world, right? Um like you said, your your brain's already hardwired to the information you've already received. And so, you know, being at that point where I I guess not realizing that I had a choice here, um, receiving that first slap, you know, and then the subsequent second apology two weeks later or so, um, it then said to my brain that, you know what, this is, this is what it is. My mom went through it. So this, this is what I have to do, right? This is what relationships are like. I guess relationships are the same in the United States as well. Um, not realizing that I had a choice. And then the more that I got, you know, I only heard from this particular vessel pouring into me that I need to do better. You're the blame. You're the one making me do this. You're the one making me speak this way, act this way, because your dress is too short. Your that hairstyle you're wearing is attracting other guys. Um, talking to this particular person when you know I don't like it, you're causing and making this happen to you. So fix it, right? And then as girls, we're taught we have another onus on us as children when we're coming up because we're given a double standard. Um, sit, you know, be quiet. Speak when you're spoken to. You know, if, when you get to a certain age, if something's wrong in your relationship as an adult, you need to fix it. Because again, parents are passing down what they know to their girls. And so, and again, for as society says it, you know, boys have the, the responsibility of just being boys. Uh, you know, just let them be. Uh, and girls are taught to be fixers from very early on or um, just shut up and take it. Right. Uh, because that's what it is. I, you know, you want a good man. You're right. You just got to do it. Right. You, you, right. you don't break up the family. Don't be the cause of that. You know, the children need their father because, again, this is what was passed down to folks. And so, again, I didn't understand that I had a choice in the matter. Um, I think if I was more aware, which is why I do this work, right? Because a lot of people don't know. They just are give, like you said, they've been fed what they've been fed and that's all they know. If they had some inclination that that's not all there, this, there was to it, maybe, maybe they might make the choice to do something different. And so coming to the end of that relationship was so I always say something out of a Lifetime movie and why I ended up writing this book because so many people had told me that I should. And so, you know, escaping that last night after my last brutal attack, um, ending up in an emergency room for the first time, 
seeking help was one of the most scariest things that I had ever done because here I was uh, potentially outing myself of the secret, not even, I shouldn't say the secret, his secret that I had kept for so long, right? Because, you know, he had said to me, if you tell people, what, what does that make you look like? Um, you know, what are you trying to, would you ever get me locked up? You know, why, why, why would I want to get a black man locked up? Right. We, we, you know, black men already have an onus responsibility on them. Right. It's like all these standards, all these stereotypes, all these things that have been fed into my mind. I just said to myself, you know what, let's just lie it out. So in the ER, I told him I fell down. The ER doctor comes into the room after x-rays says these injuries aren't consistent with you falling in the shower. Um, who did this to you? And I remember, uh, sweating, like, like hot because, oh my God, how does he already know this? How does he know this? And, you know, I, I said, you know, I, yes, somebody did this, do, do this to me. I said, but I would just want to go home, not understanding that is the most dangerous time for me. When victims decide to leave these relationships, abusers have it set in their minds that oh, it's over my dead body. Losing that power and control that they have over their victims is something that they do not want to give up. So it's either me, it's either you, it's all of us, right? So oftentimes you turn on the news and you hear, you know, she was getting ready to leave and he killed her, right? She was getting ready to, to take the kids and he killed her and the kids or killed her and left the kids behind, right? So you hear all these stories and not, it's not just because, you know, he or she just snapped and this happened, it's because it's been brewing behind closed doors for some time. And, and that's what the end looked like. Um, but, you know, I escaped. I was able to go home. Uh, that did not mean that things ended there. He, again, realized that I was stepping away, that I was I had broken up with him over the phone two weeks later when he called me. Um, he couldn't handle that tried to break into my apartment. I finally called the police. He ran away before they got there. Um, then, uh, you know, subsequently cut the phone lines in my basement. I mean, there were a whole slew of things that saw me, or I should say, I saw him spiraling um, just because I wanted to be safe just because I didn't want to get beat on anymore, just because I didn't want to be strangled or slapped or, or, or hit or punched. I mean, these are the things that led him to, to feel like he was losing out on something. Why would I want, when I got into my breaking point, which again, a lot of victims have to get to, when we decide that we're done or we're looking back, if we're, if we're fortunate enough to get to that point, right? Um, why, why would I, why would I want to step back in, into that? And that's something that they can't comprehend. It's like, how dare you leave me? I didn't tell you, you could do that. I say when this is over and they can't like their mentality is almost like, it's like, it's, 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 um, what's that term that they use? It's almost like you're locked and loaded onto one thing. Mm -hmm. And one thing only is just making the, that person hurt for making you hurt. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's nothing you can do to fix that type of mentality. Again, when we're in this, in these types of relationships, we think if we take the beatings, if we cry enough, if we stay and do the things that they're asking or demanding that things are going to get better. If they say sorry a thousand times that somewhere along the line, things are going to change, not understanding that like me as a victim who watched this and subconsciously fell into this in this way, it's the same way that they most likely learn this uh, behavior. And it's something that we could never fix no matter how long we stay. If anything, we're, we're, we're helping them to perpetuate the behavior by sticking around to be their punching bag. Um, and again, you would, I wouldn't have known this if I had, I not finally escaped. Uh, I finally filed a restraining order through the court, um, facing him in court to get that restraining order was one of the hardest things that I ever did as well. Um, but I got through it and, uh, you know, steadily began to rebuild my life, uh, because then he stayed away. Finally, uh, the restraining order made him stay away. As we know, a lot of people do not get that chance. Sometimes right. the restraining order sends abusers into a frenzy. 
Um, and if you're not doing it with people at your side, helping you, walking you through how to safety plan, how to leave these relationships safely with, you know, the help of an advocate from a domestic violence shelter, um, it gives it, it, you know, that is what gives folks a better chance of surviving once they get to the, to, to the end of these relationships. And so this is why we do the work that we do is that because we point people in the right direction for help. We make sure people know where help is, what help looks like, puts a face to what help looks like. Because again, the end is scary, right? And a lot of the times you hear victims going back at least seven to 10 times before they actually leave, if they get the chance to leave, because in part, it's what they know, right? So you get to the other side and you realize, and a lot of people have told me that I need to watch um, um, The Maid's Tale, uh, that Netflix uh, uh, mm. movie, and so I, I haven't watched it because it's it's going to bring up all the all the triggers in, right, in right. me. But um, you know, from what that talks about, from what I've heard, it's it talks about it. It really gives an insight into how hard it is or how hard it can be when leaving these relationships. Sometimes systems systems aren't there ready to provide for the people that are seeking the help. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you know, like myself, I went to the courthouse and I didn't have an, a victim witness advocate to help help me through filing the, the the restraining order. That was daunting in itself. So there are a lot of layers to leaving. It's not just why doesn't she just leave, right? It's not right. that easy. There's a lot of steps and a lot of layers to quote unquote getting safe. And so, um, you know, as hard as it is, it's better than the hell that we are dealing with. And I think a lot of people don't know that when they get to that end. It's because, you know, they think to themselves, gosh, this is way too hard. How am I going to continue to pay, to, you know, to send the children to school? How am I going to feed them? At least, you know, he beat me, but he, he took care of the kids. You know, he, he, he yelled and emotionally abused me, but at least he paid the bills. At least he kept a roof over our heads. You know, all these factors go into what leaving looks like and why people end up going back, you know, and at the very core, it's fear. So if you've left and he still has access to you, you know, because you're staying at a mother's house or a sister's house, a friend's house, and he still can call you on the phone and talk sweet nothings in your ear, uh, or uh, on the opposite flip side, yell daylight out of you, threaten you that if you don't come back, you left the kids here, I will kill them. You don't come back. I will find you and I'll kill you. You don't come back. I'll kill your parents. I'll kill the cat, right? So all of these things are things that amount to fear. And so again, when you hear people or you see people in these types of relationships going back, it's not because love is all it is. <laughs> There's many other <laughs> factors that play into play here. Um, and, you know, that's it's it's really necessary for people to understand that you if you're not helping, don't sit and judge, right? Because you don't know mm -hmm. the backstory or the or or the layers that this person is taking or has to to to, to leave. So um that's yeah. one of the things I like to point out. Yeah, you you've said a mouthful. <laughs> you said a mouthful. A lot. <laughs> one of the thing, one of the things that I that I liked that I heard you even just to be able to describe the mental thoughts of the abuser. You know, mm -hmm. um, I've had I've had a another guest on a little uh, ways back, and, and I think you should check that check out that episode. Uh, I believe it's uh, Jamie Wright was her name, and one of the things that she's doing because she's also in the in the um, domestic violence space and, and making a difference, and even you know trying to get some laws changed, you know where she is. But one of the things that she pointed out, uh, which is one of the programs that she's having to develop is also a program to reprogram the abuser. Absolutely. You know, and it was like, wow, because I, number one, I know it's not out there because I've never even heard of something like that. You it know, we, we focus on the, the, uh, those who are bruised and rightfully so. Yeah. But if that person leaves you or you leave them, they're just going to go to the next, the next person to victimize. You know, Absolutely. and so when, when she was, you know, explaining that to me and even saying that, you know, yeah, we want to look out for the victims, but we want to help the abuser too. So he is not only, you know, that, that he changes. So now he or she, because it, it goes both ways. There are some female uh, abusers also. Absolutely. So that they're not 
just moving on to the next person to do it to someone else, but they're also getting the healing that they need. And that was just an, an eye opener for me. And I, I thought that was great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there are programs across the country that do exist to, in that realm. And right here in Massachusetts, there's a, a program called Emerge and it's the same premise, right? So how, and this is so, and this is, this is voluntary, participation by an abuser who also has gotten to their breaking point, whether it's because they're at the verge of losing their family, um, they're at the verge of losing a job or whatever, whatever have you, different from what the courts had, or, you know, dish out uh, as punishment anger management, right? So you go to this program, you have to pay this exorbitant amount of money to participate. Um, and, you know, it, it's it's t supposedly teaching you how to deal with your anger as an abuser. Well, that, you know, if an abuser is hell bent on perpetuating this behavior, they're going to go to the program, sign in, do the work in person, mm -hmm. and still be heated that they had to pay this exorbitant amount of money and right. put the owner and the responsibility and the cause of this on the victim. Right. And so they're now they're even more mad. This beam, I had to go to anger management and you know, right. And so you hear these stories and it's not because it's because it wasn't a choice of theirs. Right. They were made to do it. Whereas these programs that you mentioned that Jamie, uh, you know, is 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 evolving in her in her city or state, these programs are voluntary, right? Where you know that you need to do the work, uh, and you know, obviously you're paying money, but you're saying to yourself, "I'm going to do this on on my own accord, and I'm going to make a choice to change." And and I think again, the same way that a victim has to come to the point where they've had enough and you know, for me, it took years of therapy. Um, I'm currently still in therapy. I just re-entered therapy last January after I wrote the book. So much came up there that I had to just, di you know, dissect it all. But, you know, like victims, we have to reprogram ourselves, but we have to make that choice. And part of that choice is leaving, right? So when an abuser comes to that point where they say, okay, I can't do this anymore because I know that something's wrong with, they've had an epiphany, somebody got through to them um, verbally, uh, something is major going to happen because they're perpetuating this behavior and they realize that they can continue because of that. Whatever brings them to their Jesus moment, which is what I like to call it, um, you know, they're making the choice to cut off this behavior or at least at the very least, because I don't think you ever cut off what happened to you or what you've done to somebody. I think you every day work at it and can chip and chip away at, you know, this core uh, programming that you received from a, a younger child um, being a, a, as a younger child. So yeah, there's my two cents on that, but it can be done. It does work for, again, for the people that are ready to do the work. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing that we have to understand. It, it, victim or abuser, you have to be ready um, mm -hmm. to stop or to at least be get on the road to healing uh, on both sides. So, yeah. Devon, I'm I'm, I'm going to have to have you come back, right? Because we haven't talked about the book yet. We haven't talked <laughs> about the program yet. Um, but I do think we've had some some great dialogue and, yes. and and brought up some things that needed to be brought up and and definitely listening to uh, your story. So I, I definitely want to have you back on, right? Yeah. So um, right now, what I what I want you to do, I want you to uh, I'm wanting to have let you have the last word. So I want you to just think of something that you want to leave uh, the listeners with. Uh, until next time, because we, we definitely got to finish this conversation. So yeah. just something that you would want to leave uh, to leave the listeners with, you know, a word of advice, a word of inspiration or, or whatever the word is. And, and also your uh, social media handles and where they can find the book and, you know, where they can work with you. So I want you to, you know, leave us with that. So I'll give you a couple uh, seconds to think about that. Um, to my listeners, thank you guys once again for joining in. Um, and I told you that I would tell you how you can win $100 from the podcast. So you can win $100 from the podcast by joining our super subscriber contest. What does that mean? That means you will have to subscribe 
to our YouTube channel, to our Facebook page, and also to our podcast uh, on Spotify. And after you've done those three things, after you subscribe to those three places, you will text the word WIN, W-I-N, to the number 866-326-0730 in order to qualify to win $100. The uh, contest is ongoing, so it never stops, and uh, it's random. So once you once you enter, once you've done those uh, the requirements to uh, be a part of the contest, you can win at any time because it just it just keeps going on. Uh, as long as I have some money, it, 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 <laughs> it's going to keep going. So uh, again, you can win a hundred dollars from the podcast uh, by being a super subscriber, and that just means you need to subscribe to our Facebook page, our. Uh, YouTube channel and also our uh, Spotify contest. I mean, our Spotify podcast on your listening devices. And then text the word WIN, W I N, to the number 866 326 0730 in order to qualify to uh, win $100. So, uh, Mr. Byrne, first of all, let me say again, uh, thank you so very much for being on uh, to share your story and, and, definitely to give us uh, an insight that, that we've never had, that I haven't heard before, um, especially to just be able to describe the the mental state of the abuser. That was uh, definitely eye-opening. And so we definitely have to have you back. So I'm, I'm going to make sure I, I keep saying that we got to have you back so we can finish the other part of this conversation. Um, so, but with that, uh, again, thank you for being on. Uh, you could have been doing anything else, but you're here with me and my listeners, and I appreciate it. And with that said, I'll let you have the last word. Thank you so much, Ernest. This has been a pleasure to sit and chat. Um, domestic violence awareness is 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 paramount to to my core. And uh, with that, I will say, uh, you know, to our, our social media posts yesterday uh, read uh, three lines repeatedly. Strength is not silence. Strength is not silence. Strength is not silence. To see how strong you really are, seek help. Seek help if you're in an abusive relationship and vice versa if you're doing the harm. Um, Nothing comes from keeping someone else's dirty secret. And that's what it is, their dirty secret. The person that is doing you harm does not want you to ever speak up or tell someone else what is happening to you. So if you do, gosh, the doors that will start opening, not only for you, maybe you have children, Um, gosh, for them. I always say, if it doesn't come down to to your well-being, think about your children. You may say to yourself, Gosh, they're only three years old, four years old. They're never going to remember this. I'm going to get up, you know, get up enough courage by the time they're seven or eight to leave. Children pick up on our behaviors. And if they see that you are despondent or out of sorts or feeling sad or being beaten physically, if and even if they never see you physically hit, they pick up on your sadness. Um, and so please know that even if they never see a physical hit being thrown, they know that the other person is the monster. As much as they love them, they still know that they're a monster. And you're leaving them with their imagination to figure out how much of a monster they are. And again, they're going to grow up to to perpetuate the behaviors that are being modeled for them. So again, if not for you, do it for them. Pick up the phone and call to find out where help is in your area. There are domestic violence agencies throughout the nation. And if you don't want to speak to me, you can call the National Domestic Violence Hotline 1-800-799-SAFE, S-A-F-E. Again, 1-800-799-SAFE. If you want to talk to me, that number is right here, the 799-SAFE. But if you want to talk to me, I'm going to mess up here. But (laughs) if you want to talk to me, you can call our text, our hotline. It's 888-556-9876. 888-556-9876. Again, you have the ability to text. You do not have to pick up the phone and call. Um, to just to figure out what next steps could be for you. All right. Uh, so that's that's it. And if you want to learn more about us, you can visit our website at lovelifenow.org, lovelifenow.org, or you can visit us on our social medias at Love Life Now Found with a D at the end. Love Life Now Found. All right. And also, 
where can they get the book? Yes, it's called again, The Legacy He Left Me. It is available nationwide everywhere. Walmart, Target, Amazon, uh, many bookstores, Barnes and Noble. Um, it is even if you are not listening to this in the United States, it's also in Trinidad, uh, in the Caribbean, and it is also at Hatchards in London. Um, it is a worldwide uh, cop, uh, book that really owns, kind of gives you an insight into the stuff that we talked about today. Not just me flushing my stuff out about what happened to me, but connecting the dots between behaviors and scientific um, uh, analogy as it relates to this issue of domestic violence and giving really a backside of what this means for you if you're experiencing abuse today. Again, The Legacy Left Me, The Legacy He Left Me by Laverne Gordon. Thanks so much, Ernest. I appreciate you. No problem. No problem. We can't end it no better than that. To my listeners, again, thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, again, this is the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast, and I am your host, Ernest James, and my mission is to help people to deal to heal and to fulfill, to deal with your problems, to heal from the pain and to feel, feel your purpose. So until next time, we'll see you next week. Be blessed. Hey guys, I know you're enjoying the podcast. However, don't forget to join our text line at 866-326-0730. That's 866-326-0730 in order to receive text messages with new events and things that is going on and new episodes as they release. All right, see you in a minute. Thanks for listening to the Deal to Heal with E. James podcast. Remember to listen, like, subscribe, and share. This episode has been brought to you by Deal to Heal Teas. Put some inspiration in your situation. Wear an inspirational tea and be inspired all day. Let's go to deals to heal teas.myshopify.com. Remember, our mission is to help you to deal, heal, and fulfill. Deal with your problem, heal from the pain, and fulfill your purpose. Thanks for listening.